Thank you very much. If you can't hear me, let me know. To begin with, before I get into the meat of my presentation, I would like to congratulate all the speakers and all the people that are attending, and I really am very grateful for the opportunity that you got up this morning to hear me. And, but I do think that Jim Fetzer deserves a special expression of gratitude. Jim, thank you. There are a couple of comments that I, I want to make about what has progressed and some of the things that have been said. Uh, I'm going to start out on a serious note, go to a lighter note, and, and then get more serious. I am one that does not tend to see conspiracy in many places. I, wa I want you to understand that. But uh, there are things that are very disturbing. It came up yesterday about people like Robert Frazier with the FBI. And I recall very well a couple of years ago, major article, front page, New York Times, about the problems with the FBI lab evidence even as recently as those two years ago. And I hope that I tell this right, and I, I'm sure I'm quite accurate. There was an instance down in Florida that was particularly significant. There was a gentleman who was being tried for a capital crime, could be sentenced to death. The physical evidence that linked him to the crime was a blanket that they sent to the FBI lab to test to see if his hairs could be found on the blanket. The test came back to the Florida prosecutor's office, DA's office as positive, that his hairs matched hairs in the blanket. Lo and behold, about a week later, the Florida district attorney's office realized they had sent the FBI lab the wrong blanket. It had nothing to do with the case whatsoever. This is a guy that could have faced the death penalty. So I, I, I do think that we have to be very cautious, suspicious, but again, you know, I've been involved with law enforcement for the majority of my career, so therefore, I, I guess I look at it with kind of a jaundiced eyes. Uh, a couple of comments. Jack White mentioned the Internet has been a marvelous tool to open communication. But I really see a lot of this open communication as a double-edged sword. What I'm really concerned about when we talk about the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy is the infighting and the lack of civility that exists when somebody's pet theory is challenged. I'll, I really, truly believe this. I kept a low profile, really, for 18 years, that the research community is its own worst enemy. And if we cannot disagree about things civilly, then I think it's time to get out. And if there's a time that I can't comport myself in that fashion, I hope somebody would tell me it's time to step back. I have the utmost respect for anyone that is sincere in pursuing the truth, whether, whether they believe there was a conspiracy, whether they believe there was a lone assassin. We should welcome people like Gerald Posner. Doug, just for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with the assassination community, Doug is really referring here to exchanges that have taken place over email nets and the like, and occasionally at other conferences where major disputes have broken out. So please don't infer he's addressing any aspect of this conference no. because that's not in his mind. So I just want to create the context for you. He's talking about matters with respect to which many of you are unfamiliar. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's the more you get involved with it, you're going to be aware of it. And it is not a comment on anything that has transpired here. But we should welcome those people that disagree. People like Gerald Posner or Vincent Bugliosi, who we saw on the videotape later. Because what these people do, even though Bugliosi's book has been delayed since last October, it focuses attention back on the issue. And I hope they put him on every talk show, and I hope myself or somebody else gets an opportunity to confront or debate people like Mr. Bugliosi. No one is completely right, and we can all learn from each other. I look at the early researchers. We look at Weisberg, Penn Jones, Robert Grodin, who's going to comment and perhaps even disagree with some of the things that I say today. Sylvia Mayer, Mark Lane, Jim Garrison. We should embrace those people because they had the courage to dissent and criticize what was a very unpopular position at the time that this began, and it continues to be so. But really, we stand on the shoulders of what I consider giants with what anybody progresses as we go forward. I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of these people, spending a couple days, for example, at the home of Harold Weisberg, and uh, 
another concern that I have is how people seem to want to trash some of these early researchers and the criticism, and it's unfair. Of course we learn more. Of course they change. But these people paved the way. It has been said that if you steal one person's ideas, that you're a plagiarist. If you steal many people's ideas, you're a researcher. Well, I, I, I'm a researcher. Uh, we need to be open to dissent, and again, we need to communicate. I was very reluctant to speak about the topic that I'm going to be addressing today because I've kind of almost, I think, been pigeonholed that, well, yes, he has an expertise in this area, but I want you to understand it represents really only a small portion of the work that I've done. I mean, literally, I've read over 500 books. I've got over 600 hours of videotape material, probably the same amount of audio material. I've been in the archives. I've done all of those things, too. But I would like to acknowledge some people who have pursued today's topic and perhaps even have some more expertise about some of the specific areas than I do. Though some have disagreed vehemently with me, I think I would, li I would like to recognize these people as experts, and as you listen to what I have to say, hopefully you will listen to what they have to say too and others. And that's people like Roy Schaefer, Vince Palomera, Pamela McElwain, Anthony Marsh, Millicent Craner has been a big help, and many, many others. Jack White's been a tremendous help. And I have benefited greatly from their efforts. One other comment I want to make in light of yesterday. If you're really serious, if you're new to this, don't treat this as a hobby. If this is not 100% serious to you, don't do it. I mean, literally, as I've interviewed people over the years, I've had people in their 80s that I've interviewed, Dallas police officer that did not want to talk to me because he, re and this is fairly recently, because he did not want a bullet in his head. I mean, this is not a hobby. It's, it's not a game. I take this very, very seriously. If you cannot be 100% serious about this, I think you really dishonor the memory of the fallen president. And, and, and that's my editorial, that's my opinion on that. On a less serious note, I want to know that I come before you. I know I have certain liabilities being an attorney. The first time I ever met Jim Fetzer, he came up to me and he said, Doug, you're, you're an attorney, aren't you? I said, yeah, Jim, I, I, I am. He says, did you hear about that accident? where these attorneys were on a group trip and a bus went off a cliff and 99 attorneys were killed on the bus. He says, that was a terrible tragedy. I said, well, I thought it was kind of a bizarre thing to be telling me first meeting Jim. But I said, yeah, Jim, I agree. That, but that's, that's a horrible tragedy. He says, no, Doug, I don't think you understand. The tragedy is that there was one empty seat. <laughs> but... But Jim has come around, and he has acknowledged to me recently that it is really 99% of the attorneys that give the rest of us a bad name. <laughs> I, I would like to tell a very quick story, too, before I begin my presentation that I think that illustrates this idea. It's a story about a college professor, a doctor, and an attorney. They all, they had, a, they all had a common friend who happened to be very well-to-do. We'll call him John. Anyway, John was kind of eccentric in some ways, and John was very, very wealthy. And he said to each of his three friends, he says, you know, I want to give each of you a million dollars right now and use it how you wish. But you know, there's a saying that you can't take it with you, but I'm going to try. So when I pass away, I expect each one of you to pay me back. John went on to live a long and fruitful life, and one day his time came to pass and while they were at the funeral, in the funeral home, you could see that this casket was filled with a lot of money. And the, the doctor, the professor, and the attorney got to talking afterwards about John and reminiscing. And then all of a sudden, the college professor said, you know, I've got to make a confession to the two of you. He says, John was eccentric. He asked that we put it all back, but you know, there are a lot of things that this is a tight economy now. The colleges are tightening their belt. I want to put on some JFK conferences, do some research. And uh, I'll be honest with the two of you. I only put $500,000 back in the casket. And the doctor all of a sudden starts playing with his collar. And he said, well, I've got to be honest with you too. People think that doctors make a lot of money. It's very expensive to go through medical school to keep up with the new technology, 
to keep up with the computers and those things. It's very expensive. I got to confess, I only put $400,000 back in the casket with John. The attorney looked at the two of them and he said, I, just, I can't believe the two of you. I am just so ashamed. I want both of you to know right now that I put in a check for the full amount. <laughs> For those of us that were alive on November 22, 1963, that date remains forever a current event that is embedded in our memories. I was a 10-year-old boy on that date. That fall day, I believe, defined the beginning of a turbulent era whose ripples continue to be felt today throughout our government and the nation's psyche. I have studied the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy for approximately 20 years. Like anyone that is engaged in the serious examination of the event, I have experienced a mixture of emotions that range the full gamut from hope to frustration. But I believe also that there is a basic premise that must be the foundation for anyone who pursues those events from 1963. And that premise is that if we are to be a democracy, then our history deserves truth. It has been stated that history is the myth that people choose to believe. History is the myth that people choose to believe. It is time that the myth about what occurred on November 22, 1963 be removed and buried. And I hope to take a step in that direction today in speaking with you. Some of the material I will present is not new and not original, but it is an affirmation and corroboration of the discoveries that many dedicated researchers have addressed over the years. There is no way, even with limitless money, that either of us can, any of us, no matter given how many years or how many resources, can pursue an investigation of this assassination alone. It has to be a cooperative effort, and I think that it's just, it is amazing with a community of people that have given a great portion of their time and efforts have been able to accomplish. I believe the assassination of John F. Kennedy can be analogized to a puzzle. If we are willing to critically examine the evidence that exists before us today and use each piece of the evidence as a piece of the puzzle, then we as a nation should have enough pieces to see a complete picture. That picture would conclusively show that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th, 35th President of the United States, died as a result of a conspiracy. A conspiracy that continues as the official response of our government and its apologists. Martin Luther King Jr., when asked about his lack of patriotism in criticizing the Vietnam War, once responded that he only criticized those things that he cared about. And he criticized the Vietnam War because he loved this country. He criticized, he criticized this government because he knew what it could be. Our country today collectively shares a shame by allowing myth to perpetuate and thrive about the events of November 22, 1963. And I, like Martin Luther King Jr., also criticize my government because I too care. My presentation will include excerpts from an interview I conducted in 1993. I'm going to read the excerpts to you, and you're going to actually hear the excerpts played on audio. Candidly, as naive as I am sometimes, I did not appreciate the significance of the information that was conveyed to me at the time of the interview. I thought it was interesting, maybe a small piece of the puzzle of the assassination, but today I find that piece of the evidence is comparable to what people thought was a small scrape on the side of the Titanic. The information obtained that day, combined with an examination of the totality of the evidence, should cause each one of us to reevaluate our thoughts about what occurred with the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I have personally interviewed many, many people with connections to the assassination, including a good number of members of the Dallas Police Department, who played an important role in the events that day. I think many members of the Dallas Police Department of 1963 have been unfairly criticized over the ensuing years. 
We will never know what kind of investigation they would have conducted because they were deprived of the opportunity to examine much of the evidence. Though I believe it is possible, and I've got to agree with George Michael, it's perhaps probable that some members of the Dallas police may have cooperated with the falsification of evidence, or perhaps in a more sinister fashion, the officers I have spoken with, and especially those on the lower level, I've got to say, I mean, I've interviewed people like John Carl Day for four and a half hours in this home. I have some suspicions. I'm suspicious of people like Fritz. But the people that were on the lines, I have the utmost respect for. These people were committed to the service of justice. Unfortunately, some members of another group who also were sworn to have been committed to the same standards of justice and who also had members of their group in Dallas that day did not permit the legally proper handling of evidence by the Dallas police. And those members of that group worked for the United States Secret Service. I thought it was ironic yesterday with the Biliosi, the simulation of the Oswald trial, where he asked the guy on the stand, do you think anybody in the Secret Service was involved? And the guy on the stand kind of laughed, kind of saying, of course not. Well, I think we need to reexamine that. What I present today will just be a small portion, and it's not an indictment of all of the Secret Service were there, but I'm going to give you some tidbits along the way of some things that were highly suspicious. Few people would argue against the position that the most important piece of evidence of the crime in Dallas was the president's body. It is well documented that the body was illegally removed by force from Parkland Hospital by the United States Secret Service. However, another piece of evidence was also removed, removed that day. That evidence was second importance only to the body because at the time, despite efforts to do so, and you'll see some of those efforts today, it was evidence that really could not be altered at the crime scene in Dallas. That evidence was also removed from Parkland Hospital. It was also removed by the Secret Service of the United States. That evidence would have perhaps told us a different story than what we later heard as the official explanation from the government. Of course, I'm referring to the presidential limousine. That limousine may yet tell us another story today. As I indicated, some of what I intend to present today is not new information. It is information that has been chronicled in many speeches, many books, and many articles. It is my intent to take a fresh look at credible evidence that should cause us again to re-examine the facts of November 22, 1963 in a different light. I'm going to address two questions. The first question is what happened to the limousine after the assassination and try to answer why. Second, can we now provide a reasonable explanation for the likely origin of the shot that caused the entrance wound to the throat of the president? My presentation will concentrate mainly on the damage by the rearview mirror done to the windshield. I will not explore in great depth today the hole that was alleged to have been in the floor pan or the damage done to the chrome by the windshield or perhaps some other damage. These are issues that merit further attention, but even with the gracious time I'm given today, it constricts a, a, a fair examination of those issues. I think it is important to understand some of the historical background, historical background of the limousine that played such an important role in Dallas. Did limousine the day before Kennedy's inauguration. Until it was completed, Kennedy had used a 1950 Lincoln bubble top, which had been used both by President Truman and President Eisenhower. Over 21 feet long, this new vehicle was an elongated version of the 1961 Lincoln Continental convertible. It had been the result of four years of planning and discussion with the Secret Service. It had the most more, it had more specifically designed innovations than any automobile ever used by a president. Some of the features included various roof combinations. You'll be able to see that on a slide. A hydro hydraulically controlled rear seat that could be raised and lowered up to 10 and a half inches. A railing in the middle that allowed the president to stand up during a parade. There may have also been another unique feature that I'm going to make some reference to later. 
It had a standard Lincoln Continental 430 cubic engine provided, uh, that, that provided the power for the limousine. When it was completed, it was three and a half feet longer than when it left the Lincoln Assembly Plant in Wixom, Michigan. The original stock vehicle weighed 5,215 pounds and retailed for a price of $7,347. When it was completed, with the modifications, it entailed expenditures of over $200,000 and was three and a half feet longer and weighed over 7,800 pounds, over 3,000 more pounds. Ford Motor Company technicians designed the vehicle in cooperation with Hess and Eisenhart, one of the oldest custom car body firms in the United States that was located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Their name is now changed after the retirement of Willard Hess to O'Gara and Eisenhart. This Navy Blue limousine was delivered to the White House in early June 1961. It was dubbed the X-100 by the Secret Service. It was always the property and this is important to start out with. The limousine was always the property of the Ford Motor Company. It didn't belong to the government. They leased it to the Secret Service for a token amount of $500 per year. The reason they did that was because of the pub uh, positive publicity that would be generated, especially if the exposure of people seeing this limousine in the presidential parades. I think it is also critical to note that this action also established a close relationship between the Ford Motor Company and the Secret Service. This vehicle was flown to Texas on a cargo plane one day prior to Kennedy's arrival for the Texas trip. After Kennedy was pronounced dead at Parkland Hospital and his body was removed by the Secret Service, the limousine was also hurriedly driven away. It is important to understand, and, it's, and I know many of you know this, but a lot of you are new to this conference, that in 1963, there was no federal statute that made it a crime to kill the President of the United States. No federal law addressed that whatsoever. Legally, this was a simple murder from a legal standpoint that should have been governed by the statutes of the state of Texas. Texas had the sole authority the sole authority to investigate the crime, to take evidence into their custody, to perform the autopsy on the deceased president, and pursue any criminal prosecution. The FBI and the Secret Service usurped that Texas authority. Reports surfaced that the president's body was taken by the Secret Service with guns drawn in the exercise of force. Most state statutes today would hold the individuals involved in these kind of actions criminally responsible for the obstruction of justice. Furthermore, there exists compelling evidence that certain members of those government agencies engaged in the destruction and fabrication of evidence in a capital crime. By a capital crime in Texas, the murder of somebody could be punishable by death. Under statutes today, somebody doing what the Secret Service and the FBI believe that it can be proven that they did, the individuals could be facing a sanction of incarceration in prison for up to life for any term of years. The government's official version of events of what happened after the assassination appears very simple if one conducts a cursory examination. That story explains that the limousine was flown to Washington, D.C. on the evening of November 22, 1963. It remained in the White House garage under the supervision of the Secret Service until, according to James Rowley, head of the Secret Service, it was, think of this, driven to Dearborn, Michigan, approximately 500 miles on December 20th, 1963, to redesign a bubble top. The vehicle was then driven from Dearborn, Michigan, to Cincinnati, Ohio, on December 24, 1963, to manufacture and install a bullet-resistant bubble top. This was the explanation in Mr. Fetzer writes book. When I complete a book, hopefully within the next year, you'll see the documentation. I didn't bring everything today. That uh, Mr. Rowley, head of the Secret Service, this was the explanation he provided to J. Lee Rankin, general counsel of the Warren Commission, in a letter dated January 6, 1964. Now, that version of events has been suspect for many years though proofs to the contrary 
have not emerged in any substantive or detailed form. There was a lot of reporting that provided different scenarios as to what happened to the limousine after the assassination. I think it's important to examine some of these different versions of what supposedly happened in the aftermath of the assassination. Now, some of these things are just stories, but the fact that such numerous and various varying stories exist should cause one to be suspicious. The House Select Committee, in its tenure, became very confused about what happened to the limousine. In an examination, and you're going to see the chronology of 11 specific dates, well, I'm not sure that I brought that on the overhead. In examination 11 dates regarding the limousine, beginning November 22nd, they noted that there were clear discrepancies in testimony about four of the dates when they developed their chronology. <coughs> clear, clear discrepancies. And if you read the chronology, there's actually more than four out of the 11 things. There's actually more than four. In an article in Car Exchange published in 1983, it was reported the limousine was delivered around December 12, 1963, to Hessen Eisenhardt, who performed the custom work on automobiles. However, House Select Committee was able to get the documentation. The official records of Hessen Eisenhardt show that the vehicle was delivered to them on December 13, 1963. This contradicts the information provided by James Rowley to Mr. Rankin in his January 6, 64 letter. Remember, Mr. Rowley says the limousine is in the White House garage until December 20th. Hassan Eisenhardt's official records show they received the vehicle December 13th. No record exists anywhere, newspaper article, magazine, anything, N news, radio, TV, other than James Rowley's assertion that the limousine was driven anywhere. I challenge anybody to show me one newspaper article, radio, or television report discussing this limousine being driven hundreds of miles in the harsh winters of Michigan and Ohio in December of 1963. Common sense, common sense dictates that the Secret Service would not risk a breakdown. I mean, who are they going to call it, AAA, a flat tire, or the apparent need to drive that far to refuel the vehicle? in this bloody limousine on the highways or back roads of this country, especially with always the risk of inclement, inclement weather. It would not, this car would not have been driven anywhere for such a great distance. James Raleigh, Chief of the Secret Service, common sense here tells you, was not telling the truth. And there is no documentation, documentation no corroboration to show anything different. I was never able to get a hold of Crenshaw. I know he's had some health problems, but it, he was, of course, the physician president at Parkland Hospital in 1963. And I like John Armstrong. I don't like, though I've read so many books, I don't like to rely on what's said in books. And I'm only quoting this out of his book to show that it is another story that was told that has some suspicious and interesting undertones to it. In his book, JFK Conspiracy of Silence, he wrote that three days after the assassination, Carl Renus, head of security for the Dearborn Division, keep that in mind, of the Ford Motor Company, three days after the assassination, this is not so far off, drives the limousine, helicopters hovering overhead from Washington to Cincinnati. Well, that didn't happen. I mean, if you th again, if you think that this limousine is going to travel the hundreds of miles to Cincinnati, Ohio, There'd be some report, some story, something somewhere about these helicopters hovering overhead. But Crenshaw says and noted several bullet holes, the most notable being the one in the windshield's chrome molding strip. You're going to see a slide of that. I'm not going to address that today. Roy might a little bit, which was clearly a primary strike and not a fragment. The limousine was driven by Renus to Hessen Eisenhardt in Cincinnati, where the chrome molding was replaced. A couple interesting little tw twists if there's some half-truths to this. The Secret Service told Renus to keep your mouth shut. Now, Renus was no dummy. He recalls thinking at the time, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Though, again, there's no f record in any form of media that would support this story. This is a very, Carl Re of Carl Renus. This, sh this should be something very interesting to consider. We're going to talk about a guy in a minute named F. Vaughn Ferguson. And again, 
I think what is unique about this Rena story is Secret Service Ford Motor Company. Another author noted, Gary Shaw, within 48 hours of the shots in Daly Plaza, this is close. These things are not new. As there are things, as Deb Conway would said, that many of us are just retreading the path that has been set before, of it, before us. The, within 48 hours of the shots in Daly Plaza, the Kennedy death car was shipped to the Ford Motor Company in Detroit and completely destroyed as far as evidence was concerned. Late Penn Jones, Jr., another one of who I consider a giant, recounted essentially the same information. Now let's go to one of the most intriguing accounts, and this is F. Vaughn Ferguson, and I feel compelled to address this. There has been a recently declassified interoffice memorandum, and I brought the memorandum for inclusion, Jim, if you want to include in your book. Uh, it, it's dated December 18, 1963, and it describes him being in the White House garage from November 23rd through November 27, 1963. It also kind of leaves you the impression that he was there after November 27th. He provides in that memorandum some graphic details such as cleaning blood. And this would be good. If you can't get this memorandum anywhere else, I think we ought to find a way to distribute this to at least at a conference attendees. But, but it's, it's available. Pam McElwain's site on the Internet has it. Uh, he talks about how he cleaned blood from the vehicle and actually removed and installed new carpeting. In his test, he testified to the House Select Committee that he was the individual that actually drove the limousine to Dearborn, Michigan on December 20th, 1963. Now, this story is consistent with James Rowley. The two are singing out of the same hymnal. But in one of my interviews, I've, I've actually been talking to Willard Hess, one of the co-owners of Hess and Eisenhart. He's 93 years old, remarkable man. Uh, he said this could not have happened. Again, their official records show they had the limousine on December 13th. But Mr. Hess was also shocked that he was only contacted one time by anybody, and that was by the Warren Commission, and, and asked a very innocuous question. He's puzzled as to why he was not questioned about these events, that things going on with the limousine. It was the only official contact, he told me, that was ever made with him. If we exercise some careful scrutiny, we see some notable flaw flaws with Ferguson's account of his involvement. Two of the four discrepancies noted by the House Select Committee's chronology related to Mr. Ferguson's testimony. And if we closely examine the memorandum, we have some curious findings. Here's how Mr. Ferguson describes the windshield he sees on November 23, 1963. Examination of the windshield disclose no perforation. I'm going to get to this again when I talk about the FBI examination. Discloses, this is going to be important, discloses no perforation but substantial cracks radiating a couple of inches from the center of the windshield at a point directly, I want to emphasize the word directly, beneath the mirror. I have an open invitation to anyone, though I'm going to demonstrate today that this windshield was replaced and altered, show me one diagram report or picture that shows a crack or damage at a point directly beneath the mirror. Show me one. I've never seen one. This is what he describes. Did he really see the windshield? I don't know. And the alternative, is this going to be an example, this memorandum? of evidence of the cooperation and complicity between the Ford Motor Company and the United States Secret Service to distort the actual record as to what really happened in the limousine upon its return to Washington, D.C. I'm going to have an overhead, Jim, in just a second. Can you help me out? I want the White House garage logs. And there are two, so we're going to have to put them on one at a time. He says he's there on November 23rd, 1963. You can see the dates of people they log in, everybody that checks in to the White House garage. Look at November 23rd date. It's about five down past the names. If we can show, 
these, this slide has both the names of the people checking in, the people checking them in, and the other portion of that shows why they were there. You see Ferguson's name there on November 23rd? 23rd. 23rd. His, his name's not there. You, you can look forever, it's not there. Now, this may not be conclusive. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt of sinister actions. But if his name, if he's not required to log in, what unique status did he have when all of these other people were required to log into the White House garage if they're going to have access to the limousine? This is especially important on this November 23rd date, the date he claims he first examines the vehicle. And if they got sloppy about who's going to be allowed access to the vehicle, it's certainly not going to be in those early days. There is also some critical information. I want you to look at the November 25th date. This is going to be very critical. It's going to be of paramount importance when you weigh the credibility of the statement of the witness that I interviewed from the Ford Motor Company. There, on November 25th, there are only two people checking in. One at 12, 10 a.m. in the morning, and the purpose of that check-in was to check the, it'll show the purpose. Yeah, I've, I've got one here. November 25th, the other side of this sheet, which Jim has, I don't know if, oh, it shows it right here. It's a heat check. He's checking the heat, a heater there. The other on November 25th, 5.15 a.m., is checked in, and it's going to show on the other sheet it's to repair an elevator. Neither of these two people have anything to do with the limousine. November 25th, keep this in mind. November 25th, nobody comes in to see that limousine. Nobody checks into the White House garage. Was the vehicle in the White House garage on November 25th, 1963? Why do we have two stories with what I've told you? With one Ford Motor Company employee, Carl Renas, saying he was driving the car three days after the assassination, and another Ford Motor Company employee, F. Vaughn Ferguson, stating something totally contradictory. If you want to ask me during the questions, I want to state now, too, ask me as hard a question as you want to when this is over. I've also found some interesting things about the persona in talking to Willard Hess, who knew Mr. Ferguson. Ferguson's account is also confusing in light of Rowley's January 6th memorandum to Rankum. In 1964. In that memorandum, which will also be one of the documents I'm going to provide to Jim, Rowley noted that Secret Service agent Morgan Geis of the White House garage detail requested permission to clean the blood from the back seat on November 23rd because the odor supposedly was becoming bothersome to him. According to Rowley, permission was given to him to Special Officer William Davis and White House Police Officer Andrew Hutch to remove the bloodstains on late Sunday evening, November 24, 1963. Where was Ferguson at this time? Ferguson said he was there. Why did Ferguson document in his memorandum that he was the one who cleaned the vehicle when Rowley said it's these three other people? Rowley failed to mention that Ferguson had done anything to clean the limousine. Ferguson's memorandum had said that the Secret Service had helped clean the upholstery on November 23rd, not November 24th, like Rowley said. Why did the stories conflict? These are not things that are recalled years and years later. This is at the time. His memorandum is December 18th, close proximity to when these events happen. And again, we have the documents such as the White House garage logs. A further Review of the evidence is also very revealing. Warren Commission 1964 was also provided some more confusing information that was never resolved. The record is clear that after the limousine arrived in Washington, D.C. on November 22, 1963, the FBI conducted an examination of the vehicle 
sometime after 1 a.m. on November 23rd. The FBI team was composed of agents Oren Bartlett, Charles Killiam, Cortland Cunningham, Robert Frazier, the expert on all the technical evidence, and Walter Thomas. Again, Jim will have this document in his book, and I'll have it in my book also when I complete it. But they specifically noted in their examination that there was no hole in the windshield. Let me see if I, I may have brought that. No, I, bought, I brought the Taylor one. Shoot. I had that on an overhead. Um, I guess I, I omitted to pack it. But they, said, they, they make a special mention in their examination saying that there's no hole in the windshield. This is quite interesting when you think about it. Why would someone doing an examination of something make a special point in observing what is not present? If I was asked to describe to Jim today, and they asked me what kind of shirt is Jim wearing, would I say he's wearing a red shirt, or would my response be, well, he wasn't wearing a blue sh he's not wearing a blue shirt today? What would my response logically be? Why did they have to address the question of a hole in the windshield if there was no hole? However, significantly, there were a couple of Secret Service agents who had examined that windshield a little earlier that evening. Go over the chronology. The limousine departed Parkland Hospital at approximately 2.04 p.m. on November 22, 1963. It was driven by Secret Service agent George Hickey, Jr. and a Dallas police officer. It was placed aboard a cargo plane, which was an Air Force C-130, and flown to Washington. The plane arrived officially at Andrews Air Force Base at 8 p.m. Now, I don't know why did it take so long. I, I don't know what to make of this, and I'm not attaching any sinister explanation. But why did it take over five hours to fly that limousine from Dallas to Washington, D.C.? I don't know what to make of that. Special Agent Samuel Kinney, accompanied by Agent Charles Taylor, Jr., drove the vehicle under police escort to the White House garage. Mr. Taylor was in a unique an ideal position to carefully view the windshield damage. And we're going to put his overhead of his report up now. It's going to be this one. Okay. I can find my... Uh... Ladies, I want to show you something. I, I got it. Sees the same windshield the FBI team says no hole. In addition, a particular note was a small hole just left of center in the windshield from which what appeared to be bullet fragments were removed. Looking at the same windshield. With my suspicions of the Secret Service, it is obvious to me that Charles Taylor was not part of the reindeer games that day. Uh, how do we reconcile this? Did someone fail to instruct? And he was all, this was also observed with him by Harry Geiglin, and the report was made to Mr. Geiglin. Did someone fail to instruct Taylor and Geiglin about what they were to place in their reports? How can they examine the same windshield in note startling evidence that is totally opposite to the observations of the FBI team. They see the windshield just right before the FBI does. Further controversy emerged. After the examination of the windshield in Washington, D.C. on the evening of the assassination, a windshield was removed from the automobile the next week and stored in the White House garage. This is the official story. Remember Oh, I'm going to talk to you about Ferguson. In March 1964, the Secret Service sent a windshield to the FBI laboratory, which determined that it contained no hole, only damage to the inside surface, outside surface. The inside surface was smooth. This is the March FBI report. 
However, if we go back to James Rowley's memorandum on January 6, 1964, a little bit different. Mr. Rowley mentions two other agents who were present when the limousine arrived there. We now believe those agents were Special Officer William Davis and Special Agent Morgan Geis. It was claimed, according to Rowley, that they ran their hands over the windshield and the outside surface was smooth and unbroken. Outside smooth. Try to keep that in their mind. However, neither the FBI report nor the Secret Service report, who notes everybody there, mentions these two people. Rowley also failed to admit any reference to the hole that Charles Taylor had put in his report. Raleigh's the head of the Secret Service. These reports get directed up to him. I guess just an oversight by Mr. Raleigh. On November 27, 1963, agent, Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman, who was well known for being in the passenger seat of the Kennedy limousine when Kennedy was killed, uh, claimed that he examined the windshield a short time before it was removed from the limousine. His examination of the windshield was consistent with Raleigh's assertion that he ran his hand over the outside of the windshield and he found it to be smooth. He stated he saw some damage on the inside of the windshield. In Kellerman's mind, since the outside is smooth and damage is on the inside, logically that indicates a shot from the rear. However, however, the windshield that was in the Kennedy limousine on the day of the assassination was made of safety glass. Safety glass was not necessarily commonly used at that time in our history. But the interesting thing about safety glass, it responds to an object striking its surface in the opposite way of regular glass. A shot through safety glass will leave the outside surface smooth and the inside surface will fragment. And I have an overhead on that. Flip it. So, yeah, no, all the way. So, no, flip it. One, yep. Hits the outside of the windshield with safety glass, the way safety glass is designed, penetrates the windshield. All the fragmentation is on the inside with safety glass. So, what these two people were describing is damage caused from the front. Agent Morgan Geis, who was on the White House detail, made the same error after the vehicle had been placed in the White House garage. When the vehicle was being stored there, he claimed he looked across the hood of the car, staying, stating, whatever it is, the crack is in, on the outside, this side is smooth. This side is smooth. Of further interest, we've got Kellerman examining the windshield on November 27th. We look at F. Vaughn Ferguson's memorandum again. He says that personnel from the Arlington Glass Company removed the windshield on November 25, 1963. His memorandum specifically records that the windshield was placed in a stock room under lock and key at the White House garage. When he writes the memorandum on December 18, he is unequivocal that he had not seen the windshield since November 25th when they put it under lock and key. If this is accurate, how could Agent Roy Kellerman see a windshield on November 27th, two days after it's placed under lock and key? If Mr. Ferguson's memorandum is accurate, and he was in the White House garage on that, locked away, what windshield did Kellerman see? What was really going on? They both cannot be accurate and perhaps both of them are not. But who was not telling the truth and why? Is it possible that neither were telling the truth? Again, we don't have people being logged in November 25th. When Kellerman finally got around to testifying before the Warren Commission in March 1964, he did a U-turn on his original observation. He was asked to run his hand over the inside of the windshield, and he said uh, the exact opposite noting the inside feels rather smooth today. This change statement was now consistent with an object striking the windshield from the rear. 
It also, however, it was quite obvious that the windshield that was before the Warren Commission, I will agree, did not have any hole in it. There's no hole in Exhibits 350, 351 that are presented to the Warren Commission. Uh, another researcher long ago, Robert Smith, interviewed Bill Ashby, who was a crew leader of the Arlington Glass Company team. Mr. Ashby claims he removed the windshield on November 27th. He recalled that the inside of the windshield was damaged, consistent with the damage occurring from the outside. But one windshield did he remove? If Ferguson was correct in noting the windshield had already been moved and stored away on November 25th. Again, if Ferguson is credible, why is there not any record of anyone, any people coming in, yet people from the Arlington Glass Company coming into the garage on November 25th? Because you will see if we saw that on November 27th, it isn't a thing. There are people that Ashby does check in on November 27th, but something's going on. But I'm going to suggest to you when you finish hearing my presentation, it doesn't matter what they did on November 27th. The windshield that was in Kennedy's limousine in Dallas is no longer there. Another windshield is there. Mr. Ferguson, again, I, I want to point out again in his memorandum, was, did just like the FBI agents. He reports the absence of the hole. Does the same thing. Yeah, let's excuse the FBI. Yeah, we're looking at this. We don't see a hole. I mean, how far do you go in examining a windshield? Yes, there were no pictures of signatures of Bob Hope. There were no pictures of <laughs> Fred Flintstone. I mean, you don't describe the negative. Ferguson does the same thing that the FBI agents does. Goes out of his way to note something that is not present. There have been rumors for many years that the Secret Service ordered up to 21 windshields for the limousine soon after the assassination. Rumors have been floating. I can't document this, but they've, they've been out there since 1964. And when I talk about the gentleman from Ford, there's some other interesting information I might be able to respond to you on that. But why would they order 21 windshields for this limousine after the assassination, up to 21? Could this be significant? In light of all the differing st stories, did they have to have a large number of windshields on hand in an effort to duplicate the approximate damage that was evident in the limousine in Dallas? They're not going to get it right. If, if, let's say, for example, they're going to try to duplicate the damage and leave out the hole. They're not going to get it right on their first try. And maybe this is why people are describing the windshield differently, smooth on the outside, Smooth on the inside, smooth both sides. But if that was their intent, that would explain why they would need so many windshields. Did the Secret Service substitute a windshield with a crack they fabricated and was at the windshield Ashby and Kellerman examined on November 27th? Is that why they described a windshield with inside damage indicating a shot from the front? Did the Secret Service then realize that safety glass shatters in the opposite direction? of regular glass forcing them to again substitute another windshield? Is this why the glass keeps getting described in these various ways and why Kellerman's testimony changed? Kellerman, the one time he could not lie was before the Warren Commission because at that time they could verify the condition of the glass for themselves. In an unexplainable twist, William Greer, the driver of the fateful limousine, continued to tell researchers and friends years later, right up to the day that he died, that there was no damage at all to the windshield. I mean, even Exhibits 350, 351, and what we see in the National Archives today has very clear damage. Greer says, nope, never was any damage. This is contrary to any piece of evidence proffered to anyone. In another undated letter, but apparently mailed in March 1964, Rankin, who was again senior counsel for the Warren Commission, informed J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, that the windshield has a marking which was apparently caused by a hard object hitting the windshield. And he says at this point, the windshield appears to be smooth on both sides. Was the windshield changed again? Again, you can go to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland today, 
You don't need to do that. If you get Harrison Livingston's newest version of high treason, he's got a picture of the windshield. You can accept that the cracks would have extended, but I ask you to just examine for yourself, do these cracks appear the same as Warren Commission's exhibits 350 and 351? You cannot, in changing the windshield, duplicate the exact damage each time. Well, he's got, in the new one, he's got the, the latest version when he's gone back to the archives. It, it's an updated version that they allowed him access of the windshield. And it shows it sitting in the crate. So that's what I ask you to compare. One of the tests of truth or veracity in our legal system, if you don't have physical evidence, or the physical evidence is questionable, is independent corroboration. That is, I agree with David Mantic that in our legal system, eyewitness testimony can be very, very credible. Eyewitness testimony can be bad. Scientific testimony can be bad. Either can be good. But we give more weight to eyewitness testimony when it's based upon salient facts and also when two people that have no contact with each other say they saw this and describe the same thing. Such corroboration exists here. There are many people who witnessed a hole in the limousine windshield on November 22nd at Parkland Hospital. I consider some of these people heroic as pressure was placed upon them to retract their observations. Several of these people I've talked with directly and they remain hesitant to discuss their observations and continue to fear for their personal safety. Richard Dudman, who Jim does a beautiful job in his book, a reporter for the St. Louis Dispatch in an article on December 1, 1963 entitled Commentary of an Eyewitness wrote, a few of us noticed the hole in the windshield when the limousine was standing in the emergency entrance after the president had been carried inside. A few of us noticed a hole. I could not approach close enough to see which side was the cup-shaped spot that indicated that a bullet had pierced the glass from the opposite side. Dudman told interviewers that a Secret Service agent, Secret Service agent, pushed him away and the other reporters away when he tried to examine the hole to determine direction. Mark Lane talked about, Dudman told Mark Lane this, and Mark Lane recounted this in a speech in Amherst, New Jersey in 1964. Mr. Dudman, also interesting, I just want to note, had become aware of five bullets being fired in Daly Plaza. He was also critical of the lack of security on the top of the Stemmons overpass, noting that the standing Secret Service orders were to keep the overpass clear. And he's right on that. Dilly Plaza was the only place that that overpass or something was not cleared. It was totally outside normal protocol. But he noted that back then. He also wrote, the south end of the viaduct and I just, because I'm going to refer to the south end of the overpass in a few minutes, is four short blocks from the office of the Dallas Morning News. And this is really just a curiosity where Jack Ruby was seen before and after the shooting. No one remembered for sure seeing Ruby between 12.15 and 12.45. The shooting was, of course, at 12.30. Former Dallas police officer H.R. Freeman, who was in the motorcade, was interviewed by Gil Toff in 1971. Uh, about how he observed the limousine at Parkland Hospital immediately after the shooting. He said, I was right beside it, and I've got this interview on tape. I could have touched it. It was a bullet hole. You could tell what it was. Dallas police officer staff, who was in charge of the motorcade escort to Dallas, observed in later, interviewers, in later interviews to reporters and radio stations, you could have put a pencil through the hole. In fact, he did, he told me. With extensive interviews with myself, I, I, I actually, I talk to Stavis Ellis almost every other week, one of the most honest people. He will not, like the guy from Ford, he will not tell me what I want to hear. Very candid. Is unequivocal about the hole. As he recalls these years later, he thought the hole was a little bit lower in the windshield, but he is absolutely certain of its existence. And I'm going to show you it couldn't have been lower. That recollection has to be wrong. He did describe the hole as being on the driver's side of the rearview mirror 
which is consistent with other observations and the photographic evidence which you're going to see. He told me he actually did put a pencil in the hole. He said there were numerous people and police officers at Parkland Hospital who viewed the hole. He vividly remembers that while he was observing the hole, and this story goes, it's not new to me. This goes back years and years and years he's told this. While he was observing the hole, a Secret Service agent came up to him and tried to persuade him that he was seeing a fragment, not a hole. Police officer Stavis Ellis noted, it wasn't a damn fragment, it was a hole. He's been totally consistent, never changed his description. He distinctly recalls another incident at Parkland Hospital. When a young boy who had taken photographs along the motorcade route took pictures of the limousine at Parkland Hospital, a Secret Service agent grabbed the boy's camera and exposed his film by rolling it out of the camera. They had seen this little boy in Daly Plaza shooting pictures. Later on, he's over there at Parkland Hospital after a period of time has passed. He's shooting pictures still of things going on. Secret Service agent comes up, grabs his camera, exposes his film, throws it down, and hands the boy back his camera. This is corroborated by Dallas police officer who, again, I personally talked to, James Corson, about this Secret Service agent destroying the film. They destroy this evidence when you have the identity of the assassin unknown and at a time when it was also uncertain what pictures may have been taken by the boy in Daly Plaza that could shed light on the assassination. Both these officers were absolutely shocked and they remember the boy as being extremely upset that he had been treated in such a manner by the Secret Service agent. Another person who saw the whole, Frank Cormier, another reporter for the St. Louis Dispatch. One of the most intriguing witnesses was Dr. Evalia Glanges. Dr. Glanges was a second year medical student at Southwestern, which was right next to Parkland Hospital, when it was revealed in class that the president had been shot. She knew that he had been taken to Parkland Hospital and she went to the outside of the emergency room. By just plain circumstance, she was standing next to the limousine. She leaned against the fender and viewed the hole in the windshield. Looking from the outside, she noted it was a real clean hole. A friend, also a physician, was with Dr. Gl a physician now was with Dr. Glanges that day, and she refuses to speak about this date, to this date about that incident. Dr. Glanges will not tell me her name. Her friend has a perception that this disclosure might jeopardize her employment. Glanges told me directly that she looked at the hole and said in a loud voice, gosh, something to the effect, there's a hole in the windshield. When she did that, somebody got into the vehicle and sped away, in her words, almost taking my arm off. As of 19, Glanges, credible, as of 1999, right now as we speak today, she is the chair of the surgical department at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. Credible witness. A credible witness. She stated she felt she needed to keep her mouth shut. She is insistent to me the official story is, quote, phony, unquote. She's anticipating retirement in the near future, and that's why she really opened up quite a bit to me. And she's opened up over the years, but I, I, I'm not aware of anybody else that has really interviewed her for in depth personally. When I interviewed her, she confirmed she was 100% certain, and this is a little thing I do as a lawyer, and you'll see this in my interview, that there was a hole in the windshield in the limousine at Parkland Hospital. January 1992, a caller calls in the Larry King show, states he was there, saw a hole in the windshield. Chicago Special Agent Abraham Bolden Sr., in an interview conducted by author and researcher Vince Palomera, indicated that he was aware of the existence of the hole in the windshield. He told Mr. Palomera, I heard about the hole in the windshield when I was in the Secret Service. The limousine was parked in the south lawn of the White House. They did change the windshield. Interestingly, Michael Payne, husband of Ruth Payne, the woman who Marina Oswald was residing with at the time of the assassination, had an interesting statement in his Warren Commission testimony. He says, somebody said there was a shot through the windshield of the car. So the rumors were spreading. They were there then. People saw it. He heard the rumor. Somebody said there was a shot. There was a hole. Shot through the windshield of the car. So we went down to Daly Plaza and we looked around. 
It is important to note that no person that I've named here is observing the whole knew more than one of the other people who also observed the whole. It is a powerful statement of independent corroboration. Again, on numerous occasions now, I've been interviewing Willard Hess of Hess and Eisenhart, again, a remarkable man at 93 years of age, who still goes out and gives talks about his company. I asked him, I told him this official story. He had never heard it about the limousine being driven to Detroit on December 20th and then to his place on December 24th. I asked him, I said, was the limousine driven to your company? He says, heck no. He says the limousine was flown in to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton and then brought over to the company. It was flown in for delivery of this company. Absolutely certain. I mean, just an immediate reaction. Hell no. Hell no, it wasn't driven. Right Patterson Air Force Base it was brought in. He recalled seeing a windshield, but could not see any damage to the windshield. He said he heard some allegations about a hole in the floor pan, but his company found no evidence of such a hole. And when you hear my interview, you're going to know why. I inquired as to whether the windshield was changed while in his company's possession. He responded in the affirmative, noting that the Pittsburgh Glass Company was involved, and this was to install bullet-resistant glass. Because he volunteered to me, this was necessary because the windshield that arrived at his company was standard safety glass. When you hear the guy speaking on my tape, this is also important. Again, his company's record shows the limousine arriving on December 13th, but he also made another puzzling statement to me. Again, this is one that I can't figure out that he recalls vividly. He informed me that the Secret Service had told him that the limousine had remained in Dallas for several days after the assassination. Why? It's, you know, obviously that's not true, but why would the Secret Service, I, I can't figure it out why the Secret Service agent would tell him this. He remembers it vividly. He had continual contact with the, the Secret Service when the car was flown to his company, because I wanted to find that out. Was the Secret Service constant contact with you constantly? And there was a man named John Morgan, who I'm trying to track down, I don't know if he's alive today, who was connected to the uh, Secret Service as a technical advisor, was in Ohio at least on a weekly basis. Interestingly, Mr. Morgan's expertise was in explosives. And he recalled that Mr. Morgan would assist in parade routes by examining sewers and drains that could create a security concern for the president. And this is going to be important when I suggest to you there is conclusive evidence where a shot came from. He end, ended, uh, the first time I talked to Mr. Hess, he ended our conversation with a cryptic comment that he believes that, quote, the full story has not been told, quote. He has sent me a lot of material. Unfortunately, it arrived Friday when I'm already here in Minnesota. So I've got a lot to examine that he's, he has sent me a bunch of material. In one of the conversations we had, here's the other interesting thing. Mr. Hess told me that the secret serv that the limousine ha should maintain a consistent, what he called parade speed, of 10 to 12 miles per hour. This was important for many reasons. The Secret Service had informed him that studies showed that this speed would make the president a difficult moving target for a potential assassin. It was also a speed that could comfortably allow the president to stand up during a parade and would also be a speed that would afford Secret Service agents with a reasonable opportunity to run along the side of the president's vehicle when such security was necessary. Now, the first time I talked to him, this is odd, but I, I changed my presentation because I, I'm not going to lock on this. Schaefer and I discussed this last night. He told me, and I've got the schematic of the Kennedy limousine, that there was a throttle on the dashboard to control the speed that would maintain the speed at that 10 to 12 mile per hour speed. But now he's backing off from that, and he's not saying that with certainty. Well, on November 22nd, we had a very sparse crowd where the president was shot. People were not in the street except for Mary Mormon, maybe, momentarily. Uh, not in the street. The nearest car in front of Kennedy was well ahead of his vehicle. There was no reason that that vehicle should not have maintained the Secret Service protocol of 10 to 12 miles per hour. Whether you believe in the Zapruder film or not, it doesn't matter here. 
we've determined even from the Zapruder film there is an average speed of 11 to 12 miles per hour, but there is no argument even from the Zapruder film that the vehicle was traveling at very varying speeds and would slow down significantly while on Elm Street. Why was that throttle are not being used? Or if there wasn't a throttle, if there wasn't, why was the Secret Service not following their own protocol to maintain parade speed of 10 to 12 miles per hour? This was actually the easiest portion of the whole motorcade route to comply with this protocol. I'm not aware that this issue has ever been addressed. On August 15, 1993, I was able to conduct an interview that answered many of the questions for me. And one of the things, you know, each of us, have, you know, I've spent 20 years of my life. I, because of the position I take, I may not have the best-selling book. I may not have the accolades of my comrades because of the debate that goes on. But it has been a quest for truth for myself. And this answered a lot of questions, and it's totally corroborated. I got to be honest, the awareness of the existence of this individual came to me by circumstance and is not attributable to any great investigative efforts that I can take credit for. I am still not revealing the identity of the individual at this time. I've given a number of trusted researchers the full information, unedited copy of this tape that reveals his identity just to show the veracity and to also, I, I guess, preserve it. I will reveal, I, I had promised him I would not reveal it until after his death. As I speak today, this person is still alive but in very for, poor health. I've been an attorney since 1978. And because I've been involved in the criminal arena, I have literally seen, you know, a lot of attorneys never even get in a courtroom. But I have been fortunate. And I've, I've seen thousands of people testify in the courtroom. And it has been my job for really the 13 and a, last 13 and a half years to weigh the credibility of witnesses. This individual that I interviewed was as credible a witness as I ever observed in the courtroom. I had to promise him I would not reveal the contents of the interview during his lifetime. And I'm revealing some of these contents now after successful appeal to the urgency of this information being provided for the for to the American public. I'm going to read to you what he said, and then I'm going to actually let you listen to what he said. He had worked for the Ford Motor Company, and these are excerpts because it would take too long. He had worked for the Ford Motor Company for 40 years, starting in 1934. He never forgot what happened on November 25th, 1963. The two lab men he makes reference to are now deceased. Here are some excerpts. Around noon, he's talking about the Friday of the assassination, we got it around 2 o'clock that he had been killed. So right away they called meetings to find out what we were going to do. Are we going to run Monday morning with the president being killed? We didn't decide on anything at that meeting, and being that I had charge of all power service, I was in charge of getting that plant ready to run or to shut it down and everything. So they decided they would let everything ride and they would call me on Sunday. So on Sunday around noon, I had just finished dinner. They called me up and told me to go in and make arrangements to start the plant up because we would have to start the plant up around midnight to get it going for the day shift and number two shift. So that I did, but then I arrived my normal time on Monday, and they had me on a two-way radio, and they had me on a Cushman scooter because I was covering a large plant. So I got a call from the vice president of the division, and he told me on the radio that I was wanted in the glass plant lab now. So I went down to the lab, and the door was locked. I knocked on the door, they let me in. There were two of the lab men in there and they had the windshield there. And they told me that we were to use that to, see now the car was a special built car. We were to use that windshield as a template to make a new windshield. And the windshield had a bullet hole in it coming from the outside through. You could see it from the way it was broken. But the car was in the B building where we had a repair garage and they had taken the windshield out. It was back in the glass plant. We were using it as a template. And to make a windshield, and we were told to follow it straight through until it was a finished product and get it back to the B building. We were told if anybody asked us what we were doing, we were running a template for a prototype. After describing the process for making the new windshield, he noted, we laminated it, we took it out of there, it was a finished windshield. 
We took it to the B building. It was put in that limousine. Now, that limousine had the entire interior completely stripped out. The carpeting, everything was gone. It was gone. It was nothing. It was down to metal, and they restored the whole interior. When I asked him if they stripped it at the plant, he didn't know, but he replied, I assumed it was there. That's what they did. Later on that day, he says, I met the vice president of the division, and I said to him, Bob, I said, do you know what they're doing down there in the lab this morning? He said, I don't know what was happening. He evidently knew, but he didn't want me to know he knew. That's the st whole story. It was a good, clean bullet hole, right straight through from the front. And you can tell when the bullet hits the windshield, like when you hit a rock or anything, what happens? The back chips out and the front may just have a pinhole in it. This had a clean round hole in the front and fragmented in the back. He went on and said, I went on from there and I became superintendent of the division and I had the whole five plant divisions. I had the following exchange then incurred. Do you know whatever happened to the window? My question. As far as I know, it's sitting out in Dearborn in Greenfield Village. The original windshield with a bullet hole? No, no. The windshield with a bullet? We scrapped it. We broke it up and scrapped it. Were you told to scrap it? That's right. Who told you to scrap it? That was the orders the two lab men had. They got the initial instructions, and I was called in after they got their instructions. Do you have any idea who gave those orders? I assume that it came from the vice president of the division, I would assume. All I know is that somebody told me is that we want you down there now. I want you to hear these excerpts and weigh this person, how he sounds. So could we get the audio? The, the video, we're going to do the video. It, it'll be just an audio. It was an audio interview. But these are the excerpts. Weigh what he's saying, how he's saying it. Well, we got it around 2 o'clock that he had been killed. So right away they called meetings to find out what we're going to do. Are we going to run Monday morning with the president being killed? So uh, we didn't decide on anything at that meeting. And being that I had charge of all power service, I was in charge of getting that plant ready to run or to shut it down and everything. So they decided that they would let everything ride and they would call me on Sunday. So on Sunday, around noon, I had just finished dinner, they called me and told me to go in and make arrangements to start the plant up, because we would have to start that plant up on midnight to get it going for day shift on number two ship. So uh, that I did. But then uh, I reported on my normal time on Monday, and I, they had me on a two-way radio, and they had me on uh, a Cushman scooter because I was covering a large plant. And uh, so I got a call from the uh, vice president division, and he told me over the radio that I was wanted in the glass plant lab now. So I went down to the lab, and the door was locked, and I... This was on the Monday morning, which would have been the 25th? Yeah. 25th? Yeah. And uh, I knocked on the door, and they let me in. There was two of the lab men in there. And uh, they had the wind, uh, windshield there. And uh, they told me that uh, we were to uh, use that. See, now the car was a special built car. We were to use that windshield as a template to make a new windshield. And uh, the windshield had a bullet hole in coming from the outside through. You could see it the way it was broke. So uh, we took the... the uh, Did you know where that windshield was from? They told me. I was a repair garage, right? and they had taken the windshield out. It was back in the glass plant. We were using it as a template. And to make a windshield, and we were told uh, to follow it right straight through until it was a finished product and get it back to the B building. And uh, we were told if anybody asked us what we were doing, we were running a template for a prototype. So. Lamination. This was uh, my entire re responsibility was lamination. I laminated all the windshields where my department did. And we laminated it. And we took it out of the press. We took it to the washer and washed it. We took it out of there. 
It was a finished windshield. We took it to the B building. It was put in that limousine. Now that limousine at that time had the interior completely stripped out of it. There were not no. Did it appear that that limousine interior had been all cleaned? Would that oh, definitely. The blood, the carpeting and everything was gone. It was gone. Gone. It was, it was down to metal. And they restored the whole interior. Do you have any idea, or did you ask anybody at that time, when that and when or where that had been stripped? No. Well, I assumed it was there, but that's what they did. But you did see the limousine? Oh, yes. I see the limousine. Was there, was, was there anything unusual that you saw no. on the outside features, the no. ex exterior of the limousine? No, it was still that convertible. And the people put the new windshield in, and we left. Later on in the day, I met the vice president of the division. And I said to him, Bob, I said, you know what they were doing down there in that lab this morning? And he said, I don't know what was happening. Uh, he evidently knew, but he didn't want me to know he knew. Uh, now, he's still alive. He's on Colorado with him. But uh, that's the whole story. Now, I know that I saw the windshield. It was, it was located about three inches uh, to the right of the rearview mirror. whether the, the bullet would have been one coming from the interior or one coming from the exterior. Definitely. You can tell from the way it goes in and out. So it, 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 uh, the fragmentation comes out on the back of it. You can tell which, which direction. So this, this was a, you just saw one evidence of a bullet hole. And was that, did that bullet appear to have come to hit in the interior first? No, it came from the front. It came from the front. You had no question about that, that yeah, that no bullet mark that bullet was from the front. It was a good, clean bullet hole right straight through the yeah. front. And you could tell us when a bullet hits the windshield, shoot it. Like when, when you hit a, a rock or anything, what happens? The back will chip out and the front may just have a little pinhole in it. Right. This had a clean round hole in the front and fragmentized the front of the back. So no question in your we mind that, we knew that, that that windshield was hit from the front. Sure. Did anybody... Talking about going out to Greenfield Village. Of stuff that they didn't have on later, later, years on later. Car covered up. The tire now was made into a, a, a four door. Right. It has bulletproof glass on all of the windows around and in the back window. Now, you know, bulletproof stuff that's that. What did you put a bubble top on it or something? No. No, it's a regular four. They had the ability to put a bubble top on it in yeah. November of 63. Yeah. Oh, I see. Kennedy did not want to have it on. I know, because he was in uh, contact with the crowd. And then, so I come over, I, I stepped over the, the rope they've got around it. Right. And I went in and got looked at it. My wife said, you're going to get in trouble for getting there. This was so before right it was on public it. display. Uh, the windshield is the windshield of the window. It's not public. It's a regular standard laminated window. Is that, that, is that the window? Zero to 100%. How certain are you that the bullet hole that you saw on the windshield came from the front? 100% certain? 90% certain? I worked in the glass in, uh, industry for uh, 40 years, and I've seen all kinds of testing on glass, and I know it was from the front. So you're 100% certain? I'm 100% positive that it came from the front. Why should you believe him? I think it is important to examine some of the reasons that support his credibility. 
He states this happens on November 25th, 1963. Just happens to coincidentally pick the only date in the White House garage log that doesn't show anyone checking in to see the limousine. He does not know anyone nor has ever had contact with anyone named as seeing the windshield at Parkland Hospital. Three, he spoke with me only with great reluctance. I had had the encouragement of his son. The gentleman's wife was very fearful. That's that noise you hear in the background. She doesn't want him talking to me. She can be heard in the background. What she's doing is urging him to leave, to stop the interview. Let's get out of there. Her final statement to me was one of fear, stating, we have family, you know. This guy has never researched or even read a book on the assassination. You didn't hear the whole interview, but he made mistakes that would be expected. He thought the limousine had been flown in from Houston, not D.C. He thought the Ford Motor Company leased a vehicle to the federal government for a dollar a year. We know it was 500 a year. But if he had been a student of the assassination, he would have had his story down pat. I mean, any time we're in court, if somebody has everything too clean, automatically the antenna has to go up. You become suspicious. He's never been to Dallas, Texas. He was only certain of what he saw. He would have no way of knowing that what he observed would be corroborated by other evidence, especially the knowledge that a unique geographical location in Daly Plaza would confirm the origination of a shot causing this hole in the windshield. Five, it was obvious that he was deeply concerned by what he, was, what he saw that day. He was concerned even as we talked this, to that day, he's in his 80s, that this information could lead back to him. He must have reflected on what he did that day very much since 1963. He was remarkably clear about his recall. He realized something was not in order. He did not try to fill in details about what others did. The only thing you'll hear him do is make assumptions. I assume this happened. He did not try to make up things to me and say, well, this happened, this happened. Only describe for me, perfect witness, what he saw. Why would he lie? This guy doesn't seek any attention or publicity. I had to promise him not to use this information during his lifetime. And again, I only have it now with the consent obtained through his son. I verified that he talked about this within his family since that date in 1963 on regular occasions. He had two sons. One is now deceased. The other son was a high school student in 1963. He recalls very vividly his dad, especially in those early years, talking about that at the dinner table. In talks with his son since this interview in 19, six, uh, 1993, I believe that he re regrets that he allowed me to interview him. He was very hesitant and, and panicked when he saw that I had a tape recorder out and wanted to interview the, wanted to tape this conversation. I had to have, again, the urging of his son to, to, to get the tape. He's resisted any opportunity for me to talk to him since that time. But again, he suffered a stroke within the last year or so, and his memories and health have severely suffered. The most important verification that I believe legitimizes his disclosure is that when I interviewed him in 1993, he was not aware that there was any other windshield in existence for the vehicle other than the one he helped build on November 25, 1963. He was not aware of Commission Exhibits 350 and 351 that they existed. He was not aware that a cracked windshield was presented to the Warren Commission. In his mind, there is no cracked windshield in 1993 out there. He, they destroyed the old one, he built a new one. And when he went to Henry Ford Village years later, he was satisfied that that flawless windshield he looked at was the same windshield he made on November 25th. He goes to Greenfield Village. It pulls up the tarp, sees a windshield, sees this pure, clean windshield. He says, yep, there's the one we built. Not aware of all, these, all this controversy about a cracked windshield. Important to note that his information is corroborated by Willard Hess. The two recollections are entirely consistent with each other. The statement from this guy at Ford explains why Mr. Hess saw an undamaged standard laminated windshield because that's what this guy built 
and may explain why a hole in the floor plan was not discovered in Cincinnati. The car was stripped down to metal. Again, go back. There's nothing new. I claim nothing new for much of what I do. I talked about Gary Shaw and Penn Jones Jr. writing about the removal of the windshield within the first few days. In Mark Lane's speech on March 12, 1964, in Amherst, Massachusetts, he noted the Secret Service flew the car immediately to Washington, where the windshield was removed, and the car was then flown to Dearborn, where the entire interior was refurbished, probably forever destroying a good portion of the physical evidence. Mark Lane was exactly right. Wherever he got his source, says exactly what this guy is saying. Roy Schaefer provided me with a United Press International report that was, came out on Wednesday, December 18, 1963. This is interesting. December 18, this report's in the paper. Again, according to Raleigh, the car is in the White House garage till December 20th. The article read, Detroit, December 18. The car in which President Kennedy was assassinated is being refitted with bulletproof glass and armor plate for use by President Johnson. The work on the famous bubble top presidential continental is being done at a Ford Motor Company experimental garage in suburban Dearborn. But Ford officials in the Secret Service declined to comment. However, sources said the limousine in which Kennedy was killed and Texas Governor John Connolly was wounded in Dallas was brought to Dearborn under a cloak of, cloak of secrecy Saturday night. That would have made this, this like December 8th. All we got to do is switch to some, this article, that this information, to November 25th, and it's perfect. The article later made two other important observations. It was learned that the following at work is being done. A new windshield has been installed lending credence to reports the old one was damaged in the shooting. At the conclusion of the article, this is December 18, 1963, UPI. At the conclusion, it stated, new trim and carpeting had been installed in the back seat where Mr. Kennedy was riding when he was shot. What do we make of that? If it refers to that earlier date, and we know that it, the car is officially received by Hessen Eisenhardt, on December 13th, if somebody had gotten this information, all you do is you take it back to November 25th, and this is exactly what that man said. It's been stated often that secrets cannot be kept. It's clear that information was leaking out soon after the assassination. The Ferguson Memorandum that was written on December 18th, 1963, has only recently been released. Was this at the time an effort by the Ford Motor Company? in cooperation with the Secret Service to purposely distort the record of what really happened? In reviewing the UPI article, is it merely a coincidence that the garage being described in Dearborn and the work being done to the limousine is exactly what the witness I interviewed in 1993 asserted, except for a little change in date? Did the government's position get tangled in its own distortions and lies? The significance of this information, if you believe it, if you accept it, is overwhelming. It reveals a link of complicity by James Raleigh, Chief of the Secret Service, and Lyndon Johnson, the new President of the United States, the only two people in the United States that had the power and authority to approve of the movement of the vehicle from Washington to Dearborn. Don't kid yourself that Johnson would have been kept in the dark. Johnson knew everything that was going on, including his calls that I believe to Parkland Hospital finding out Oswald's condition. He was on top of everything. And again, there goes another story that we'll, you can read in my book someday, too. Uh, it also demonstrates a sinister complicity by the Ford Motor Company in cooperating with the deception and criminal destruction of evidence. Further evidence of the complicity with Johnson and the Secret Service, I'm going to have to address at the, another time. Interesting note, you know who the first person to shake Johnson's hand was when he got off the, uh, Andrew, the plane on Andrews Air Force Base? When he arrived back in Washington, D.C.? Close. James Rowley. First person. Just coincidence, but first person to shake his hand happened to be James Rowley. The shot, I'm, I'm going to address another piece of evidence. You're going to see quite a bit of slides in. Do you need a two-minute stretch break? 
let's take let's take a, let's take just a couple three minutes. I could use it too. I think that one of the important questions now is if we have this evidence, what does it tell us? How did that shot in the windshield get there, and when could of it could or would it have had occurred? I believe it was likely the first or the second shot, and now I'm becoming more and more convinced that it would correspond somewhere between Zapruder frames 216 to 224. Likely the second shot, I'm going to show you the slides all at once to maintain some continuity. I've got quite a few slides that you'll see momentarily. But Stavis Ellis saw what he believed to be a shot hit the ground shortly after the Elm Street turn. You know, as we get into the Zapruder film debate, the part that has always puzzled me the most is why Zapruder would have stopped filming and begin filming again when the motorcade is coming around the corner and then magically there's the limousine. And this is interesting when you listen to what Ellis has to say that he saw because what that would have eliminated is what he saw here. He says right after he had turned back, he was about 25 feet or so in front of Kennedy's limousine, had looked, I'm sorry, 100 to 125 feet in front of the limousine, and he had looked back and he had noticed debris from the ground kick up consistent with a shot on the south side of Elm Street across from the depository. He has sent me a diagram. I'm going to show you exactly where he said he saw this kick up. James Cheney, who was so isolated after that day when he did some TV interviews, which in those interviews he said Kennedy was the second shot hit Kennedy in the face, which is curious with what I've got to say now, was put under wraps. Cheney also saw that debris come up. They showed the FBI agents that were investigating for the Warren Commission exactly where they saw that debris come up. And they told them that they could not have seen such a shot. Told the Dallas police officers, you could not have seen that. Ellis restated the same observation to the House Select Committee investigators. It's in JFK document number 013841. Now, why would somebody fire an early shot? If we're looking at the sixth floor depository, I'm not sure the shot came from there. Possibility it came from the roof or whatever. But of course you have the tree obstructing the view. So if Ellis describes where this shot took place, a shot from the depository, the tree would be an obstruction. However, if the major function of this shot was to create a diversion to draw spectators' attention away from other places, it didn't matter where the shot hit or if the tree was in the way or not. It didn't matter. Any person, and where he points it out is where their pe crowds weren't standing, interestingly enough. Any person present in Delhi Plaza, your first attention is going to be drawn to the nearest sound. I think it's a significant interest that many of the witnesses believe the first shot sounded like a firecracker are one of the first few shots. We thought firecrackers were going off. What is more interesting is that some witnesses thought the firecracker sound sounded like it was right in the limousine. I confirmed this with Bill Newman again just a few weeks ago. He's testified about this in the past in interviews. He, his words to me is, yeah, I thought the firecracker sound appeared to be by the limousine. I've done the test myself. One phenomena that would absolutely sound like a firecracker in the vicinity of the limousine was if a bullet hit the windshield. Test it out. It's going to sound, you're going to get a firecracker-like sound, the impact of a bullet hitting the windshield. And Roy, who I've got all the respect in the world, knows much more the technical aspect of this, just shaking his head, yes. But he, Mr. Newman, is also one of many witnesses who further maintains this date, his belief that the limousine came to a stop or near stop during the shooting on Elm Street. But like I said, Secret Service protocol, 10 to 12 miles per hour, even the Zapruder film, we have the car going down as low as three miles per hour. If a witness from Ford is to have credibility, it is important that we discern a location from where a shot to the windshield would have originated. Bob Groden probably doesn't remember this. We talked about this actually just about a year ago. He. We disagree, I guess, and you'll have to form your own opinion. And maybe I've persuaded them differently today that the Alchins photographs 
I believe, shows evidence, clear evidence of a whole. And what they did with the Alton's photograph, I believe, also is indicative of that evidence of a whole. Not only is the mark I'm going to show you in the slides in a couple minutes consistent with exactly, it's, it's consistent exactly where this person from Ford and people said they saw the hole in the windshield, exactly consistent. Actually, why don't we, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and do the, I'm, I'm going to show you those slides now. Do I just need to hit forward? Am I aiming at something wrong? Yeah? Okay. No, I got I got I got it. I'm trying to Yep. Get me out of your way if I'm in your way. Rear view mirror right here. This is from Bob Grodin's book, hole right there. And what I'm going to show you is how that hole also lines up with the shot that hits Kennedy in the throat. I think it's the most likely explanation. Nebula right here. It's going to, if we see the larger photograph, it's going to look like it's left ear. But see this distortion in the glass? The shot's going to cause distortion. See the dot in the middle? I believe that's the hole. Here's why I'm suspicious, too, that they knew it was a hole and they covered it up. Look what somebody did later in publishing a photograph. You don't see a dot there. They put a diagonal line. Anytime somebody changes something, again, my antenna goes up. Nothing else has changed. Rear view mirror is a little distorted. But look how they put that diagonal line right there. If you looked at the newspaper the next day, this is what was published in the newspaper this day. They took it out altogether. They took that whole area out altogether. This is what's published in the newspaper. How about in the torch's past? In the torch's past. It's in there. Oh, OK. That was like in December. OK, I've got to get back to this stuff. Okay, we're going to. Just stay on that. But I'm suspicious. Uh, they, they, they bleep it out. The next day, this is published in the newspaper, November 23rd, 1963. You have three different photographs. <coughs> yeah, it sure does look to be it, doesn't it? It's very suspicious. But but you're seeing yeah Greer's face looks to be these look to be almost animated they look to be enlarged they look to be enlarged these look like you know pe people with supersized heads had to be touched but they obviously touch out this area you see Kennedy clutching his hands towards his throat but when I see this suspicious and it gives me more credence. What I did after I showed, after I uh, looked at this evidence, I went down to Daly Plaza. Now, if I believe there's a hole there, I believe I, I'm going to have to determine where that shot could have come from. And it, I had talked to, I don't know if Rick Russo was, was an entrance wound, was powerful. Uh, you've heard the stories. Malcolm Perry, Life Magazine first quoted him as stating that Kennedy must have turned around exposing his throat to the uh, shooter's nest. He knew that was an entrance wound. Press conference, very clear. Where was the question? Where was the entrance wound? Perry, there was an entrance wound in the neck in regards to the one in the head, I cannot say. Question, which way was the bullet coming on the neck wound? At him? Perry, it appeared to be coming at him. Perry, next page, the wound appeared to be an entrance wound in the front of the throat, he says. Yes, that is correct. Baxter in 1979 uh, says entry wound, 1992, says Looking at the hole, one would have to think in my immediate thought that this was an entry wound because it was so small. McClellan, Dr. McClellan noted it was a throat wound, had the appearance of the usual entrance wound of a bullet. Uh, Charles Carrico, the wound was a small penetrating wound. Gene Aiken, doctor, another doctor, must have been an entrance wound. Uh, the lay witnesses, Dr. Manning pointed out, 
Nurse Diana Bowron, well, it looked like an entry wound. And uh, the evidence went on and on. I, I just want to note, Perry only reevaluated his statement only after he had a lot of pressure from the Secret Service. And there's documentation of that. And the other thing that Perry did, I know there's at least one other attorney here today, very skillful. You have to understand this when you can ask hypothetical questions of an expert witness. But if, you, if your hypothetical has an invalid assumption, you can come up with a total, you can force a totally different response. Spectre was very clever. Because he knew there was no cross-examination, he hypothetically set up his question, and then when he asked the ultimate question, Perry would say, you know, then is it possible that the wound could have been one from the back? He said yes. But I'm going to tell you that the methodology that he used, and I could very easily use it. I question Dr. Perry, and I, I say this not in a bragging sort of way or anything, just I think any good attorney can do this. I could have gotten, without cross-examination, I could have gotten Dr. Perry to admit that all of Kennedy's wounds were self-inflicted if you set up the right hypotheticals. Uh, there's a lot of recent research done in this. Millicent Craner has been just wonderful with me. She pr has provided. I admit, I'm going to tell you, when it gets into ballistics and stuff like this, I know my limitations. I don't pretend to be an expert on all of these things. But I look to people that I know that they are, that I trust, and I corroborate that. That's what I do. And Millicent Craner has done some excellent work. She, she can go through things that probably only Dr. Mante can, well, maybe the rest of you can, can understand showing how persuasive it is that that is an entrance wound. Again, this location that we saw on the windshield is identical to what the person from the Ford Motor Plant described. The only physical reaction we see from Kennedy is the motion of raising his arms to the areas of his throat. And this obviously has to be one of the first few shots because we know that the Alton's photograph, even though there is some debate, supposedly corresponds to approximately Zubruder frame 255. But it's like the evidence of the shot is more likely between 216 to 224. Again, I'm assuming that anybody shooting through the windshield, and we're going to look at that, why would they do that, was trying to hit the president. The only logical place that works to the exclusion of any other location uh, is behind, excuse me, is on the south side of the underpass near the top of the Stemmons Freeway. Let's see if I can get to that slide. I, I, want, I want the Daily Plaza. There we go. Greg Jaynes provided this to me. And I just want everybody to understand as I talk where I'm talking about. This is one of the best photographs I think I, I've ever seen of a, a Daily Plaza overview. Where I'm talking about is right here. Depending when the shot took place, we don't know exactly because of the frames, but it's taking place somewhere in here. The shooter's location could actually vary about 15 feet. Any one of these spots, if you stand there, is concealed from anybody standing on the overpass. You can't What's see. Sewer well, I'm going I'm to go to that. Sewer drain really has nothing to do with it. No, it's, it's because of the 45 degree angle. That it, it's, it's symmetrical. It has a 45 degree angle there and here. So if you're anywhere behind here, you cannot be seen from there. But also, there is a parking lot here. I'm going to explain some of the other things that have occurred since the assassination and in this area. But very isolated. I mean, anybody watching, you have, um, uh, who is it down here? Tag down here. You have some police officers and some people that shouldn't have been standing up there. Everybody else is up here. The place I was describing, Stavis Ellis, the shot he sees lands right here. So the shot is taking place, would have taken place as Kennedy's vehicle is turning the corner. Some people say, that Kennedy's vehicle, the interesting thing, almost hit the curb by the depository. How would that be significant? Because if it did, it puts it even on more of an angle that this becomes a straight on shot from the south side of the underpass, if that's true. Doesn't need to happen to prove that happened. It may have been deliberate then that he swung so hard and stopped and virtually come to a halt there as Roy truly testified well, that the shot to occur. My theory will rest and you're only seeing a brief part of it, that certain members of the Secret Service allowed the assassination to happen. 
and I'm going to talk about that at the end. Let me hold the questions, and I will answer, again, any questions at the end. But I, this is the area that I'm talking about. It's the only area uh, that works. The highest standard of proof in the American system of justice is beyond a reasonable doubt. In some states, they equate this term to moral certainty. Neither a shot from this area, the hole in the windshield, an entrance wound to the throat of the president, or the location of the limousine when Kennedy reaches his, for his throat can work independently unless you coordinate these variables in unison. They all have to work together. If a shot, if he's not hit in the throat, if the windshield hole is happened somewhere else, none of these things work together. They work perfectly in unison with this scenario that I've just provided to you. Is there any corroboration for such a shot? It would certainly enhance the validity of such a conclusion. An extensive review of the literature on the assassination does yield some positive results. If you got Texas Monthly Magazine for November 1998, Har just made some interesting cryptic statements. He says, I was trying to find out where the shots came from. I, I saw up on the grassy knoll, people falling down, people around me were hitting the ground. I ran up the grassy knoll to look up at the railroad tracks. He's running over here, and I couldn't see anything there. So I ran back down on my motorcycle, and I thought, what is he going to think? God, is he thinking depository here? What's his next thought? He says, I thought maybe he might be on the other side. So I motored down beneath the underpass, right underneath this area, and looked up on the other side and didn't see anyone over there, so I came back. The significance of this is, is that this is an automatic reflex reaction. What is he thinking? It's not there. Gosh, it must be over on the other side. History might have a different record today had Officer Hard just went first to the south side of the underpass. There was also early speculation about a shot from the South Grassy Knoll area, and I guess I'm not going to go get into all of those, but there was also other evidence presented to the House Select Committee uh, that it was asked that they investigated that, and I'm going to show you the Frank Cancellaire photograph, which shows this area within one minute after the assassination. And they wanted to have one guy try to persuade the House Select Committee to do studies on that, and perhaps Robert can shed some light on that but the studies were never done. Uh, Dr. Robert McClellan, Jenkins, Adolf, Graf, I'll wait for the slide on that. There's another guy, if you follow the internet, I'm legally, pro I'm told, and I'm not going to jeopardize it, I'm legally prohibited. I mean, he has no idea. Well, geez, Doug Weldon has found an interesting aspect. Boy, wouldn't it be great if my story just happens to jive 100% with what he's saying. Uh, I am confident that this individual was unaware of any of the facts that I've presented to you today. He just, in the middle of the statement, and, and again, I've read, I've been read this full statement, he talks about how he went up there and uh, smelled the gunpowder. There's also, I should note, I'm going to point out to you a photographic, this person appears to me to be credible, and that one of the Cancellaire photos, the Cancellaire photographs, one of them shows to be showing an individual standing in the area that he claimed he was at the time of the assassination. The most interesting thing I found was in Penn Joan Jr.'s. I mean, God bless these early researchers. I mean, I see somebody like Robert Groden here. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe just because they pioneered the way. Uh, but he wrote just an innocuous thing in his Forgive My Grief 4 book. And here's what he writes. He says, one witness to the assassination of President Kennedy told this writer that shortly after the shooting, he observed a woman being taped by a TV camera. He heard her say that she saw a shot fired from the south side of the railroad overpass as the president was killed. And this guy says, to our knowledge, there is no record that this tape was ever shown on TV. In fact, we never know the identity of this woman. The guy that told Penn Jones this did so because he was there when they were doing the interview. He was in the, within the TV cameras. He stayed, as Penn Jones says, he stayed up all night hoping to see himself on TV. Of course, 1963, to be on a TV would be a real treat. And these kind of things. Stayed up all night. Corroborates exactly what I said. 
shooter from the south side of the knoll. It provides the most practical and reasonable explanation for a shot that if could have caused the wound to the president's throat. We hear the things about the umbrella man, who I think is a signal man, but the flechette and all of these things. If it's real complicated, again, I look for the most reasonable, simple solution that can answer a question, and that is likely to be the accurate solution. This makes more sense. Why would a shooter fire a shot through the windshield of a car from this relatively great distance in order to hit Kennedy. The distance from the top of the south side of the underpass to Kennedy would have been about 225 yards. There are some logical answers to that question. You have to understand the logistics of the underpass here. Researcher Jack Brazil and other people always raise the issue that some shots could have been fired. There's a storm drain here, and there was a storm drain here that literally you could, a, a guy about six foot tall could stand up and it would be at about shoulder height. You can actually look into the one on the north side today. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But Brazil said a shooter could stand up in the storm drain and would have been in position to brace a rifle for a perfect shot. With a grate removed from the drain, a vehicle could be parked over the drain providing total concealment for the shooter. This would have been true on the north side. It would have been true on the south side. I think John Armstrong has left. John's got an interesting thing that he found. I've never been able to follow up on the guy. I can't find him. Is that Dilly Plaza was de designed to be an urban development. So there are sewer drains going all through Dilly Plaza, and they go, much down, they go down much further. Open sewers. It was designed for a residential plat when they first designed Dilly Plaza. There's an interesting story that soon after the assassination, there's a pharmacist that sees some people about a half mile down coming out of these storm drains and all dirty and jumping into a car and taking off. Whether or not, I don't know what the logistics are, how wide the storm drain was here on the south side. And, and, and we can't know now. Uh, but it was part of this intricate network. Again, you can examine the north side of the storm drain uh, today if you want to and see what it looked like. But there was a corresponding drain on the south side on November 22, 1963. It, like I said, it was also concealed from anyone on the main side of the underpass, 45 degree angle. It is documented, we know there were police officers there and people that violated standard secret service protocol. Uh, and again, depending where the shot occurred, there could be a 15 feet variance. The person could still have been concealed but I think it's likely that the storm drain is, would have been the most ideal position. This storm drain, go there today, it's now paved over. You can't see it. It's paved over. Again, I always get a little suspicious when I see them distort evidence. It's like on the grassy knoll shot, now they've erected this sign now. Robert, you probably see it every day that anybody that wants to see the shot, they can't see it anymore because it's in the way. Oh, Thank goodness. I mean, it was just unbelievable that they did that. Uh, but also, they put an electrical box in front of the storm drain there. If you could have gotten into it, this electrical box is in the way now. Um, but you can still work out the angles, and it can still work even with that there. Now, I tried to, say, I tried to find out, why did they pave over that drain? Well, they said, well, you know, there, there's walkways now on the overpass, and it's really a safety issue to have a storm drain there. Well, my retort is, why is it a safety issue here and not here? I mean, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe innocuous, maybe innocent. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps not. The other interesting thing is that this angle provided an unobstructed view to the limousine. It was very isolated. Any spectators, I mean, if I'm going to watch Kennedy, I'm not going to say, geez, let me get myself positioned over here. I'm going to get myself as close as I can to view. You got some, most, you got people standing in here, here, you know, you're not going to be that far away. So it, it's very isolated. Uh, the LA Plaza, as opposed to the motorcade, full motorcade route, contained a very sparse crowd. This was the end of the parade route. The attention of everyone was focused on the motorcade, the crowd, and the immediate surroundings. 
there was no reason for anybody to scan up on this, to look at this area, to check it out if you're just a spectator. Why would you look over here? You're going to look at what's going on, the business, what's going on. You're not, you're not even going to think to look over there. Uh, the other thing that I never appreciated, in those of you that have been to Dallas, is you can't tell what a lo long slope, what a deep slope Elm Street is. From the top of here to the top of here, it's not much difference in height. It's maybe an 8 degree trajectory, a downward trajectory, 8 to 18 degrees, somewhere in that range. Very small, but you can appreciate that. I mean, the two things with Delhi Plaza is obviously you're just floored by how small it really is. But how high this street is in comparison to here, which actually makes it a very slight downward trajectory. Also, with the limousine coming this way, with it being such straight on, it really wasn't much of a moving target. And if it did take that full turn and come straight on, if it is almost straight on, it's not, the target is stationary because the target is coming right towards you and actually getting bigger. If you have even two seconds, you don't see a moving target. You've got the vehicle coming towards you. It made that an ideal location. A serious sniper would have practiced a shot for accuracy, trajectory, and to determine what ammunition could penetrate the safety glass with the desired effect. The one factor nobody could plan on that day, why would you shoot from there, was the weather. They had bad weather that morning. What if Kennedy had used the bubble top? Or had used the bubble top for some other reason? It would have created a multitude of problems for any shooter. However, if you have planned the shot through the windshield, reasonable variations in the weather would not have General Ted Clifton and General Godfrey McHugh were two of Kennedy's aides. In almost every motorcade, I'm going to show you, the, you'll see it on the slide, one of them rode in the front seat between the two FBI agents. You usually, almost without exception, had three people riding in the front seat. On this date, Godfrey McHugh had expected to ride in the front seat of the limousine. He was placed in the back of the motorcade. He later admitted this was unusual. This was the first time he was advised not to ride in the car, and the reason they gave him was so that all attention could be focused on Kennedy. Well, what kind of logical sense does that make? If he's in the front seat of the car, how does that affect attention being focused on Kennedy? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think he ever wore a clown suit or anything that would have, uh, you know, <laughs> taken away from Kennedy's attention. But obviously, if you have a person sitting in that front sh seat, if somebody is sitting in this front seat, you do not have a trajectory at Kennedy. You do not. You do not. You cannot see Kennedy through a scope. And you're going to see this on video and in slides, what you can see. You cannot see him if somebody is sitting in that front seat. No secret, servants, uh, secret service agents on Kennedy's limousine. This was attributed to Kennedy's orders, though there not, does not appear to be any support for such a position. I'm going to show you something interesting on that. Overpasses had been cleared except for Daly Plaza. No precautions had been taken for open windows and buildings. No action was taken. A report filed on the man with the un ever filed on the man with the open umbrella in Daly Plaza on what turned out to be a sunny day. Not one agent mentioned this incident in their reports that day. Again, my book will chronicle many, many. This is just a, a smattering of the evidence. Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry noted that security was relatively light in the area of Elm Street. He made some revealing statements to the Warren Commission. First of all, in the planning, he says, in the planning of this motorcade, we had more motorcycles lined up to be with the president's car, but the Secret Service didn't want that many. Question, did they tell you why? Well, we actually had two on each side, but we wanted four on each side, and they asked us to drop out some of them and back down the motorcade along the motorcade, which we did. Secret Service Agent Emery Roberts was in command of the agents in the follow-up car to the Kennedy vehicle. He ordered the agents not to move after the sound of the first shot. Agent John Reddy 
had begun to move towards Kennedy and was called back by Roberts. It was Agent Roberts who appeared to take command of the situation at Parkland Hospital, exercising an authority he did not possess. Billy Joe Martin, another motorcycle Kate officer, reported that four motorcycle officers covering the presidential limousine were ordered that under no circumstances were they to leave their positions regardless of what happened. They weren't to leave their positions. Regardless of what happens, you don't leave where we put you. Martin told the Warren Commission that the Secret Service told them that they didn't want anyone riding past the president's car and they were to ride to the rear. He allegedly told his girlfriend, Jean Hill, Johnson's Secret Service people came over to the motorcycle cops and gave us a bunch of instructions. They also ordered us into the damnest escort formation I've ever seen. Ordinarily, you bracket the car with four motorcycles, one on each fender. But this time, they told the four of us assigned to the president's car there'd be no forward escorts. We were to stay well in back and not let ourselves get ahead of the car's rear wheels under any circumstances. I've never heard of a formation like that, much less ridden in one, but they said they wanted the crowds to get an unrestricted view of the president. Well, I guess somebody got an unrestricted view of him, all right. It's only a few of the suspicious examples of the Secret Service that day. If you are objective, and if you find only one witness that I have presented to be credible, then there is powerful evidence that a shooter fired a shot through the windshield of the Kennedy limousine from the south side of the underpass. It is likely that this shot resulted in the wound to Kennedy's throat. The security that existed in Daly Plaza was the responsibility of the United States Secret Service. Their actions, only of which a few I have chronicled, can only lead to the conclusion that certain members of that group participated in the killing and or the cover-up. It is clear that not one observation by any witness, the evidence of the whole, the statements of the people can work with any other explanation. This evidence passed the test of independent corroboration, geographical limitations, and necessity, time constraints, but also supported the photographic evidence. It can be de demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt that unlike the windshield, there is evidence that's not, that was not destroyed. That evidence remains alive in the testimony, the independent corroboration, the photographic evidence, and in Daily Plaza itself. The final question I want to address to you today before I show you some slides and give you one final comment is to ascertain the difficulty of the shot. I said it was 225 yards away. I'll concede that only certain ammunition could result in a clean hold of the windshield and cause a wound to Kennedy's throat. One expert wrote me that the throat wound was too small to have been made by a 6.5 millimeter projectile. The wound is more consistent with a 5 to 6 millimeter caliber ammunition. There was a multitude of highly accurate cartridges in 1963 that could perform accurately from the distance of the south underpass. He further noted that for a bullet to penetrate automobile safety glass and inflict a uniform wound, it would indicate a non-frangible or full metal jacketed projectile. I can't reveal this guy's name. This guy is still connected with the Department of Defense of the United States military. He is an expert. I further consulted with a number of experts about the feasibility of a shot originating from this location. All responded without exception that it was not a difficult shot for a world-class sniper. One such expert is John Richen formerly the U.S. Army and now a gunsmith and ballistics expert. I conservative, I, this distance is about 225 yards, but I, I try to be conservative. I inquired, I said, uh, let's say that Shooter was 300 yards away trying to take this shot, and let's further say that they had a silencer. What would the effect of that be? And could a person shoot from that distance? His reply was, a world-class shooter could easily shoot one-inch groupings at the range you specify. A sniper will always maximize the range out to 1,000 yards and some even beyond in order to minimize detection and location. A silencer will not adversely affect accuracy, and while it will not muffle the crack of a supersonic bullet, it will, however, silence the muzzle crack, confusing people as to the location of the shooter. First of all, I think I'll, I'll go through the slides, then I'm going to show you the video, and then I've only got about two more minutes. Okay, you've seen these. The 
official statement explanation was because that there were no Secret Service agents on Kennedy's limousine that day was that Kennedy refused to have any Secret Service agents on his limousine. This is on Main Street. Apparently, Kennedy came to that decision in the last two blocks of his life that no secret, whoops. I can find it again now. Here we go. Oh, shoot. Clint Hill on Main Street is riding on the back of Kennedy's vehicle. The story's phony. Refused to let any Secret Service agents be on his vehicle. This is the damage that was done to the chrome. Roy Schaefer in the commentary might talk about this a little bit. Again, it takes a whole other presentation. And I'm tired of being known for this limousine. I want to do some of my other things. <laughs> this is what the view would look like from the storm drain area looking at it. And I'm going to show you a video that I took down there, too. I have nowhere near with a vi video camera or my camera to bring in this in as close as what somebody with a high-powered scope could do. You're going to be am amazed with some of these things. This is bringing it a little bit closer. You can, even here, you can clearly see figures, but wait till you see on the video. It's going to be very clear. This is uh, the Cancellaire photograph, 30 to 60 seconds after the assassination. Here's the south side of the underpass. This is the truck. The guy's legs, if we could see, Jack White could probably come in on that. He knows who I'm talking about. But the guy was, there was a man actually where this man said he was standing that right after the assassination went up here and smelled gunpowder. This, this is the full copy of the Alchins. This, right here. It, it corresponds with Kennedy's left ear. This is the Kennedy limousine. Jim, I just want to point this out. I, I'm not going to make any accusation, but Jim, I just got to do this because I, I've asked a lot of law enforcement agents. Jim Fetzer pointed this out to me. I think somebody told him about it, is that Clint Hill was a hero after this assassination for what he tried to do. Look at his jacket or look at the photographs. 95% of the law enforcement people that I show this photograph to, I say, is there anything unusual? They say, yeah, he's wearing a bulletproof vest. I've got friends that are and have been Secret Service agents, FBI, DEA, ATF. I've been in the law enforcement community. If he, did, if he was wearing a vest on November 22, 1963, this, again, would have been highly, highly unusual. It's more conspicuous in the print on the cover of the Much, much more so. Much, much more so. Just look at it. I'm not, not making any accusations. This one has always entertained me. You know, Malcolm killed a, you know, saying that clearly a shot uh, entered the back of Kennedy's head and uh, came out the front. I, I don't know here. Sometimes I think maybe the, the real explanation was that you know, they say that he erred later, that maybe they were performing a sobriety test and he was trying to hit, touch his nose. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit 350, not the windshield. I, 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 there's not the windshield. Compare Exhibit 350 with a photograph in Livingston's new book, too. The cracks, of course, are going to expand over time, but examine... How, the direction of the cracks and everything. This See, is what the Secret Service produced claiming it was a Exactly. I don't think this was taken that, that night at all. Uh, so concerned, this is Parkland Hospital. Secret Service agent reaching into the car, famous bucket of water, destroying evidence at Parkland Hospital. Believe sincerely, Secret Service doing it. Secret Service agents telling people that they're not holes, not... You know, all these things, it goes on and on. Out of order, I think I've got another one of these slides. This is uh, McHugh. This is where he would have ridden, was supposed to have ridden that day. Would totally have blocked a shot going to Kennedy had he been allowed to ride where he expected to ride. He expected to be sitting in that seat 
on that day. He was told, no, we want you back in the motorcade so that more people can pay attention to Kennedy back here. These are the, I, I think this would be interesting, and Roy might want to explain some of these things. These are the White House Secret Service garage photos. It's reversed. Again, my, we had technical difficulties to begin with. Apologize for that. What's interesting to me is how overexposed or whatever they kept this. You can't tell what the heck is here. Look, 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 look I mean, they just, you can't tell. The basic damage, I don't know if this was, I, I, I'm sure it was deliberate. Back seat again. Photographs are taking away. It's reversed too. Roy, you, you're the one that asked me to reverse that. <laughs> By the way, I want to give credit. I, that stuff, the stuff called the King Hill Hall is that white object in the far corner. It's very important later on. Okay. And I actually refer to this object yeah. inside. Again, look at the exposure on this. I mean, you can't tell anything. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, this is a correct photo. The other was reversed. Oh, yeah, right. Well, it, it says a stuffed. I don't. I'm not convinced whether it's either a stuffed dog or the chrysanthemum. I, I t See, Roy, you and I tend to disagree. I, I, I didn't want to get in a debate with you on last night. I'll be honest. I tend to believe it's a chrysanthemum, but it's not real important. Yeah. Okay. What, whatever. It, it's not real critical. Again, we we, we can't. Th this is so distorted and overexposed. We can't. We can't tell anything. You know, just look how black they keep this area. I, I don't have the sophistication to do that. I'll tell you, I'm a computer novice in these things. Again, this is another photograph of the bucket cleaning up the limousine. And it, that's what it actually says, cleaning up some of the gore. Well, I've been on murder scenes. I've gone to autopsies. I, I, I've actually been at murders. You don't clean up when you're at a murder scene. You don't clean up. You preserve everything. What did they clean? I don't know what they're cleaning. He's reaching in. Uh, who, I mean, it's got to be, scr scr blood, got to be scr scrubbing the blood on the seat. Not very well from those other photographs. But they got a bucket of water, and there's you know, other evidence of a sponge. Dev, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Again, another, this is a 6-4 view of the window. Again, Stavisella says that this first shot he sees debris flying up happens right here. They, that's reversed, too. We, we tried this morning. We had a tough time. <laughs> this is also Millicent Craner, back about 1991, was in Daly Plaza. This guy, she was just talking to him claimed that he was in Daly Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. His name was Johnny Brown, it was the name he gave, said he saw a shooter from the south side of the underpass. Just volunteered it to her. Again, I don't know the guy. We didn't say, you know, get together and say, let's fool Millie. So, uh, oh, this I want to get into. For, for one reason. Jim Fetzer had contacted me, and I don't know if the person is here, Jim, saying that there are some photographs that were never published taken by the Associated Press that conclusively show that there was a not that there was not a hole in the windshield. Well, I wrote Jim back, I had those photographs. I've got the whole series. So just for curiosity's sake, I'm going to show you, these are the unpublished photographs taken by the Associated Press at Parkland Hospital, and if somebody can show me evidence in any of these photographs, that it, sh it shows to me no evidence either way, but shows that there's clearly not a hole in the windshield, please point it out to me. But I'll just show you this because these were unpublished photographs. You're not going to see them in any book. No evidence there. <laughs> I mean, this is just, it's just, it, it was bizarre when Jim, when you contacted me with this. Because I, I, I don't know what the purpose was, but I thought, oh, God, somebody's got something that's going to sabotage everything I've done. The only other interesting thing is I'm going to mention, 
is that a lot of people, some people believe that Cecil Stoughton might have taken more pictures at Parkland that have never been published because he took so few, and that was unlike him. He took the two bucket photographs you Right, but he should have taken more. And where those photographs are and why, I don't know. My suspicion is that they might show just the opposite. They might clearly show the hole. Again, nothing here. They're, they're taking the bubble top out of the trunk. You don't even see the limousine here. And these, I, I purchased the entire set. Again, I'm not on a John Armstrong budget, but I, you know, I thought if something was important, I was going to dig deep. And uh, <laughs> nothing. I mean, That's it. You, okay, I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Roy, if you want to discuss, that was your slide. Well, I, I need to cover some other things, though, first. That, that's the entire set of unpublished Associated Press photographs. You've seen them. So form your own conclusion. I want to run the videotape again, and then I've got about two minutes after that. But I just want to show you how I... These cars are going to be going about 25 miles per hour. Remember, Kennedy's car is going 3 to 12 miles per hour maximum. But I'm using a camera, and I'm on that south side storm drain filming what it would look like to a shooter with a Kennedy vehicle coming down. And you'll hear my commentary, which was... I'm on the Stemmons Freeway overpass. I'm looking down directly in front of the depository where we know where the first you shot hit you can see the people? or we, excuse me, was believed to have hit. Uh, this demonstrates very clearly that a high-powered rifle from this point, which at the time was in the vicinity of a storm drain on the south side of the overpass, this is consistent with a bullet hole going through the front window uh, in probably hitting Kennedy in the throat. The angle, the trajectory, everything is very consistent with that type of shot being taken. It is very clear that it, and remember, uh, Kennedy's with a magnification of a scope that a person angle could indeed have been aiming at Kennedy. Kennedy. It has to be now focusing an back, uh, this would be a real view without the benefit of a scope. However, it does appear that everything does line up perfectly at this point and would be consistent with a shot, uh, which is probably took some place somewhere along where we see these signs of above Elm Street, which would be consistent with the Alton's photograph. This is the most likely site it really appears to be the only site that would provide an explanation uh, for a shot through the windshield, uh, which we have evidence of, and a shot that would also hit Kennedy. We're looking at this now from lower on a ground level, which even indicates that it's more likely uh, that this area was consistent yeah, this is nothing like a uh, high with a shot. Scope. Uh, through the windshield for somebody that would have been aiming at Kennedy. I'm going to focus this in with some magnification. They get a high-powered scope. Which we're at now could even make that more likely. See how clear you can see the people all the everything, way on the trajectory. Houston everything and seems to line up perfectly uh, from this point. This point uh, was where the sewer drain was in 1963. That area is now paved over uh, directly from the overpass to one of the holes in the overpass. Also, this would have been a very inconspicuous place uh, because everyone would have been focused on the limousine and would have been either down on the plaza or some other vantage points. I'm looking through a tube, which would make this equivalent to a scope. And actually, this is. And I'm trying to hold this bulky camera, too. 
could correlate with a shot. We see a bus turning now. Right there, the shot would have taken place. Okay, hit stop on that. Again, I'm hand-holding this camera, this bulky camera, uh, a rifle. And this doesn't equate to high-powered scope. The trajectory works perfect. There's a little bit of distortion because of the screen, but you can't believe how clear you can actually see the people in the vehicles. The conclusions that I have been forced to reach in light of compelling evidence are not only disturbing, but they leave me really with emptiness and sadness. As I said, I was 10 years old on November 22nd, 1963. Over half the people alive in the United States today had yet to be born on that date. People ask, what difference does it make what happened over 35 years ago? It's a legitimate question. As I noted at the beginning of my presentation, for those of us who were alive on that day, it will always remain a current event in our lifetimes. It is a date that is forever frozen in our memories. As a 10-year-old boy, I saw the world as frightening but full of promise. John F. Kennedy was the President of the United States. It meant something in a way that it never has since. People have become very cynical about our leaders. Whether Kennedy was liked or not, was good or bad, something did change that day. A faith and trust in government was lost that can only be cleansed by the truth. History deserves truth. The people alive now and of future generations also deserve that truth. I hope that everyone can recapture the promise that we should have. Walter Lippmann once asked the rhetorical, rhetorical question, is why do old men plant trees that they will never see grow? The answer is obvious. To survive as a people, we must be concerned for our children, our grandchildren, and beyond. People need to remember the promise that they once had. History not only deserves truth, it requires truth. It is only when that happens that we are truly a nation of, by, and for the people. You've let me be up here a very, very long time, and I'm very gracious for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions after the commentary.